Well, good morning. I'm really glad to be here with you this morning. You know, I always say that I love looking out at your faces, and I do. It gives me this little buzz of happy blessing uh, when I see you. So uh, I'm so glad that we're together. We well, you know last week's lesson ended on a high note. Um, Elijah heard from the Lord, and he was renewed in that prophetic calling of his. God shared specifically with this, this lonely man, this lonely prophet, that he wasn't alone. Okay, first and foremost, most important, he knew from God's interaction with him that the Lord was with him in that still small voice. And he learned that there were 7,000 other followers of Yahweh there in Israel. Okay, the 7,000. These are people who have never given in to the idol worship that was going on in Israel at that time. They remain true to the Lord. They were the faithful remnant. Well, in today's lesson, we're going to meet one of the 7,000. His name is Naboth. We know that um, he was a righteous man making God's choices. Now, the story of Naboth doesn't unfold quite how we might like, however. This lesson is entitled Blood in the Vineyard. Okay, that's a great title, and it sounds like a Agatha Christie mystery, um, but there is no um, mystery in this because we know who the perpetrators of the crime are. So, um, 1 Kings chapter 21, it does seem that evil is getting the upper hand, and a horrible thing happens to a good person. So, we'll be looking at that chapter today. The main players are Naboth, Jezebel, Elijah and Ahab, and we're going to look at the passage then through the roles that these people play in, in the scripture. But before that, let's do pray together. Okay. Lord, I do thank you for this time this morning that we can be gathered, and I pray, Lord, that you'll open our hearts, open our minds, and by the power of your spirit, help us to receive your word, and I do pray that um, we will be transformed because of our study of your word together. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're gonna start with a good guy, that kind of helps. We're gonna start with Naboth. And how do we know that he's righteous? We don't really get a lot of information about him. We have verses one through three, and then there's just kind of some other things that are implied throughout um, the rest of the chapter. But um, here's verses one through three. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it's close to my palace, and I'll give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you for whatever it's worth. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So Ahab went home sullen and angry. Okay, so what can we glean about Naboth from these verses and then from the bits in the rest of the chapter? Well, first off, Naboth invokes the name of the Lord. He uses that covenant name for God. That covenant name is the, the name that the people of Israel would use when they're thinking of all the promises and all the investment God has made in them as a people. So that name of God was so, so sacred that they didn't even say it um, or write it, but they would um, uh, have ways that they could sort of put it in there. But in our Bibles, in our translations, it's either written um, Jehovah or Yahweh, or sometimes Lord, all capitals, L-O-R-D. Um, so in all of that, um, Naboth's use of the word that implies his belief in God as their covenant God and the creator and Lord of all that exists now and forever. Okay, second thing about Naboth is that he knows the history and the meaning of his land holding. He knows that that parcel of land was given to his family by the leaders of Israel who were following God's directions as they entered the promised land. And he knows that it's his family alone that's supposed to 
steward that land. So Naboth has assumed responsibility for the land in his generation. Third, we know he's a man of courage. The king has asked for his land. Surely Naboth knew the reputation of Ahab, the reputation of Jezebel. His land was next to their palatial residence after all. But this is what I like about Naboth. He courageously puts allegiance to the God of Israel above allegiance to the King of Israel. And now we realize that can't have been easy. He must have had some inkling that his refusal could bring trouble. And then later in the chapter, we see Naboth attending a proclaimed day of prayer and fasting. And I believe that that indicates his concern for the spiritual and physical well-being of his neighbors and his own household. So we need to know a little bit more about these a day of prayer and fasting back in that time. So a day that was called for prayer and fasting was called when there was some kind of a, a disaster or a danger or a judgment to be avoided. And occasionally a day like this might bring to light a person who's, who is sinning and thereby bringing God's judgment down on the people. So Naboth doesn't know, of course, that this particular day of prayer and fasting has been rigged ahead of time by Jezebel. As we said, he was a righteous man who had the courage to stand up for God's covenant ways and protect his land. And for that, he's resented He's framed for a crime he didn't commit, and he's put to death. So this is the grave injustice that we meet in this passage. Naboth, the vineyard owner, didn't deserve the treatment that he receives at the hands of Jezebel's henchmen. And our study guide asked the question, how are we to respond when we know an injustice is taking place or has taken place? And you know, I would guess that all of us at some time or other have seen someone bullied or falsely accused, having something taken away from them that they needed or deserved, treated with disrespect. Um, we're encouraged to pray that the Lord would help us to look beyond um, the way we just sort of always accepted those kind of things, um, or we incline to we just say, well, that's, that's the way the world is, what can we do? Um, and to pray that we see people as God sees them and to work for change. I think it's wise to ask the Lord to help us to not turn away from suffering and injustice and to show us appropriate ways that we can be involved. Now, I know many of you have been involved in that kind of mercy ministry or justice ministry um, at times just to underprivileged groups, but I would really encourage you in your groups to talk about this question. It's important. And um, you can share how God has moved your own heart to be involved and also think of ideas and ways that we as a believing community um, can be involved in this kind of work. So I hope you do spend some time in your groups on that. Okay, <clears throat> we need to move along to Jezebel and her part in the story. And basically, Jezebel is detestable. She is detested, and rightly so, because she has done great harm to the very souls of God's people. Jezebel is the daughter of a priest king from the land of Phoenicia, and it's a pagan place, so she would have no knowledge of the living God. Um, even at that, Ahab marries her, and we would hope, you know, if Ahab marries her, that he would influence her, you know, the right way, that she would begin to understand God's ways. But instead, it seems like all the influence went the other direction. And what happens is that Ahab becomes more like Jezebel, and Israel becomes more like the pagan country that she came from. Jezebel instituted idol worship in Israel. You know, her idols right there in the same places they were supposed to be worshiping the living God. She chased down God's prophets and killed them, had them murdered. And when she couldn't fully eliminate the worship of um, Yahweh, she just misuses and co-ops Israel's religious practices to accomplish her own plans. She twists God's ways 
for her own evil purposes. So this is what happened. She comes home, finds Ahab sulking, refusing to eat uh, because he couldn't get Naboth to give him the vineyard. Um, so Jezebel says, hey, cheer up, have something to eat. I'm gonna take this into my own hands. I'm gonna get you that vineyard. And sure enough, Jezebel misuses the very practices of good governance and good religion that the Israelites had. She writes letters. She seals them with Ahab's seal. She manipulates the nobles and the leaders of that town to set up a fake day of prayer and fasting. And what she does then, she has two false witnesses and she seats them right across from Naboth. Um, so in the course of events at the appropriate time in this day, um, she has these false witnesses come forward and accuse Naboth of cursing the Lord and of cursing the king. And he's stoned to death for his punishment. <clears throat> well, then we've got King Ahab. And in this story, Ahab is um, kind of there as the foil for Naboth. They are polar opposites. Naboth has stayed true to God's teaching and is a righteous man. Um, Naboth, um, I'm sorry, Ahab is characterized as someone who sold himself to do evil by not believing in anything, not living up to any ethical standard. Ahab is then complicit in Jezebel's idolatry and the murders that she commits. I just, as I thought about him, I thought this is the original despicable me, but without any humor and without any redeeming qualities whatsoever. So for Ahab, the murder of Naboth was nothing to him, just nothing. So what if injustice was done? As long as he got what he wanted, it's as if he says, oh, I got my vineyard, that's all I care about. Well, finally, in uh, verse 17, our hero, Elijah, shows up. And with all that Elijah went through back in chapter 19, it's good to know he's back on the job, isn't it? He persevered. He persevered through that discouragement and that desire to just run away and quit, even run away and die. So the Lord uses Elijah again and uses him to go and to confront Ahab. And how does Ahab greet him? with a sneer, okay? You can just picture this face of his as he says, so you found me, my enemy. I mean, you can almost hear his voice like dripping with disdain as he addresses Elijah. And Elijah replies, yes, I have found you because you sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? And then, because of Ahab's great sin against Naboth, um, because of the way that he caused all Israel to sin, Elijah then pronounces total destruction on Ahab's household. And a particularly horrible death is prophesied for Jezebel, involving carrion eaters and such. And verse 25 repeats that charge against him. Never was anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Well, that's why, listening to all that, that's why the last two verses of this chapter just come as a total surprise. Could the evil Ahab actually have a change of heart? And you know, when I first read these last verses in the chapter, I thought, huh, I mean, I was skeptical. I actually felt skeptical about this. I mean, Ahab has had other chances to repent. We remember the scene at Mount Carmel. I mean, there were um, 450 of the prophets of the false god Baal, and they were utterly, utterly defeated there. Um, in chapter 20 uh, of um, 1 Kings, we don't deal with that chapter in our study guide because Elijah's not in it, but Ahab's in it. And in that chapter, Ahab actually had another opportunity to trust and obey God. God spoke into his life through um, an unnamed prophet. But instead of following what he's told or asked to do, Ahab forgets God and he goes off and does things completely his own way. And yet here are the last verses. 
When Ahab heard these words, that's the pronouncement of Elijah, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, fasted, and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. So Ahab's done so much wrong. How are we to understand this turn of events? Well, let's listen to some verses that come from other places in, in the Old Testament. And this one is from Joel. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He relents over disaster. And this is from um, the prophet Jeremiah. Go and proclaim to the people, return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. And then one more, this is Psalm 103. God does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. So why does God respond with forgiveness to Ahab? Because he's God and because he is true to his own character. And that's how this story from First Kings fits with the, the larger redemptive story of God's love. God is the source of all mercy in this world. He longs to show mercy to those who are far from him and he gives them every opportunity to repent and to believe before he would close the door. These are verses from the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is God's invitation to us. That's the essence of the gospel. That's good news. Let's pray together. We thank you and praise you, Father God, for the example of righteous Naboth, for the example of persevering Elijah, and for the example of your glorious forgiveness. Please strengthen us to keep our love for you and our love for your ways the very highest priority in our lives. Help us to live securely in that, in this insecure world. So it's in the wonderful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Bless you. God bless you.